Okay, and now for something completely different. What's interesting about today so far is that everyone's talking about main streets in the sense of retail and losing our retail. So I wanted to talk about the unavenues today. I want to talk about it in the sense of housing and change because, and a shout out to Lauren Cap, who's here today, who was actually the planner that worked very, very hard on the first competitions for the housing on Main Street's intensification in 1991. I think he was a teenager then, um, as was I. And, um, but we've been talking about the uh, aspect of house, housing, um, not so much as the retail. And our focus today on, on our talk, and I have to say, uh, my partner James Brown is here with me, who's worked tremendously hard on this material as well, um, is that the idea about the main, about on avenues, and I want to talk kind of summarize the ideas very quickly and then get into a bit more detail. It's a convergence of a number of ideas. First is about the on avenues. Not so much the east-west streets, which are mostly our main streets. I want to talk about park lots, where we have our north-south arteries and where they're aligned with our original park lot divisions. Those are potential areas for building in the city that we've been recognizing and exploring. The other, th the other part of this is to actually talk about the built form, and that's come up a lot today, about more in the sense of how it limits, res how it limits uh, retail and how it limits the actual reality and authenticity of main streets, but how we, can, we really need to look at new forms of built form when we're looking at main streets, but especially in our case, looking at the unavenues. And the other idea is how, how to actually find spaces in the city to build new housing. People have been talking about uh, laneway housing, which is very, you know, it's a wonderful initiative. Gentle infill, which is a nice, nice, uh, an, an important idea, and none of what we're proposing today kind of uh, negates that, but we think there needs to be something fairly new that has to be looked at in the city. How do we build in the city? Uh, let me go forward here. Yeah, okay. This one. Oh, that one. Okay. So the idea, the idea of the on avenues is to take the existing, I can't talk like this. Sorry. The idea of the unavenues is to take the single family housing that's on, this is a typical street here, but the idea to kind of supplant the original small houses that are around there that have been degraded over time because in 1950 these uh, many of these streets were widened because of traffic and nothing else ever happened. They were sort of left hanging there. So we'll come back to that idea, but the idea of actually developing a new type of built form that looks at open space and housing at the same time. There are relationships to housing that get lost in Main Street housing, and that is the relationship of going to your front door. If you think of any house, any single family house or duplex in the city, you get to the curb, you go up a couple steps, you have the sidewalk, you go up a couple more steps, you go up to your porch, you go to your front door. All of those things are an important part of living in the city and living in a nice place to live. Now, the idea of looking at a different housing type along the on avenues is really trying to cement the idea of new streets and new open spaces and new housing in ways that still are integrated and complement each other. So the idea and the other part of that is to actually talk about on, ave on avenues as being a, an incremental kind of uh, replacement of housing on these streets so that you eventually get to the new, a new boulevard, which can be completely reimagined. Envision zero street design, complete street ideas. Part of that then again is that kind of incremental, or incremental replacement, but by a new built form that actually allows you some flexibility in how you relate to streets, how you relate to open spaces, how the housing relates to that, and how you can have flexibility, whether it's either what, what you have on the ground floor, if it's retail, or if it's institutional, or if it's open to the street. But the idea of, of linking courtyards to housing types that can be adjusted to give you the density that's required and allowed. This is in the contrast to the sort of what we call the Toronto ziggurat type, that whenever you see anything you're a little bit afraid of, set it back. <clears throat> and here it is. So this is an example. But, um, and this is an example along College Street. 
And, uh, and so really the whole idea is that we have a setback along here, which is set back on the basis of the single family house. So whether or not you think Main Streets is being kind of, kind of uh, regulated by setback, it's really being regulated by the Yellow Belt. The Yellow Belt still has control even on the outside of its boundaries. So here's some other examples of that. And, and the idea, I mean, what concerns me about these types is that they're so dense and there is no open space associated with that at all. They don't add things to the street because they aren't allowed to. They only have, I don't know, three and a half meter streets that you can actually do anything with. And there's no, that the type does not give you that opportunity to actually manipulate spaces in any way. Um, this is, this was my throwback slide to the uh, Housing on Main Street's competition, which was in 1991, I think. But the idea of that scheme was actually, even then we were talking about creating, sorry, I can't see this, can't really see it very well. But the idea of a Main Street type that actually kind of could frame a frontage to the street, create an open space, and actually kind of make that mesh of those spaces through, this is a Young Street site, so that you can actually kind of create housing and main floors in a way that actually made an interesting housing type. Now you look at this model diagram, you see the main street type, and you take, see the kind of negative space in there. That is potential space that could be manipulated. So when you see this, the first, the first diagram is showing the standard main street type in the setback model. Flip it over to the other side and then lay it down. So suddenly that main street, that open space that was kind of, that was marooned on the top here, doing no one any good, got to the front, but now it's kind of laid on its side, so it actually has a relationship to the street. And that's sort of the beginning point where we start looking at this type. So you have a courtyard type, and this is all kind of based on earlier research. This is all independent research, by the way, funded by, um, Brown and Story, <laughs> an independent granting organization. Um, we should go for charitable status at this point. But uh, really what this allows us to do in a site that's about, and, and we have different kind of uh, templates for this, 40 by 40, 80 by 80, 125 by 125. Uh, what this allows you to do is to actually kind of adjust your height. So if you want something that's kind of low on the street edge, or do you want a courtyard on the side, or if this is in relationship to houses on the other side, and if you need to get that density up, then you know, there's ways of adjusting that in that site rather than bulking up. So we get to the yellow belt, which is an amazing phrase. I think Sean Galbraith kind of created that phrase, but it's, it's, when you look at this, you see some east-west streets kind of crossing it, but you don't see any of our on avenues at all. And really it's, it's kind of a, there's something I wanted to say about that. Well, the whole po the point is, is that it doesn't recognize anything other than that sea of, of the yellow belt. And when you look back at this original, original kind of plan of the on avenues, all of these on avenues are formed by the seams between park lots, and many of them have subway, all these red dots represent the ones that have subways at the end. So we have that kind of infrastructure of transit that we can work with to actually build housing on these things. So all of these park lots are fairly regularly spaced and there's about 16 of these subway stops. So they all represent pretty interesting places and almost all of those have been widened over time and left kind of degraded housing types on their sides you probably can't even remember seeing one. So what we've been doing in the last couple of months is working with uh, students in the Masters of Urban Design studio at uh, the Daniel School. And we've been working on a number of sites with them. We've looked at Dufferin Street and we've looked at Greenwood Avenue in the East End. And also looked at Ossington and Christie in-house as uh, in ways of developing this idea. And these are pictures that were provided by Adria L. Shell, one of our students that you got from Toronto Archives. So this is um, Dufferin Street, looking south from Dundas. And this is before it's been widened. But even in a very kind of modest street, you can see you still have 
sidewalks and you have beautiful poles and you have uh, yards and steps up to the porch and a kind of a normalized city street. This is after it's widening and you can see that all of those kind of that little bit of kind of public stuff has all disappeared. And so that's, that's it right after it's widening. And again, in another shot, looking the other direction, looking north from Dundas, uh, you can see here, which is more striking, you can see, you know, there's a verge, there's a sidewalk, and there's kind of larger houses along here. And it's really uh, has a certain width, which is taken away from it at that point. This is a, these are shots of Dufferin Street uh, today. That's the one I think it's at uh, looking south at college. And this, I think this one's looking south from Dundas. But you see they have a sort of an anonymity to them. I mean, speaking about the, uh, when Tamara was talking about looking at avenues with character areas, these are, these are un-avenues with characters yet to be defined. So one of the two other streets that we are looking at, here's, that's actually kind of interesting because you see, this is Dover Court, and here's Ossington, and here's Christie. And what's interesting about these is that Dover Court is not, is, is a, was more of a planned street. You can see by the blocks, all the blocks line up all along. Being a seam in a park lot, you can see at Ossington and at Christie, none of these blocks are, are uh, aligned with each other at all. And these streets have always been seams. They don't work together, one side of the street to the other. This is a shot of Ossington. So going back to the built form type, we want to be able to insert a built form type like that into, in this case, it's Ossington in the far side. And I'm going to flip that over. Oh, sorry, this is showing that, again, that incremental kind of addition of that building form type. So we're taking the first block from the face of Ossington to the laneway on both sides of the street. And then these are, this is kind of taking it and putting it on its side. So you can see areas like here's, this is for instance, Deuceon School. This is, this thing isn't working. But the see Deuceon School at the far right of the, of the slide. And these are really kind of diagrammatic, but they're talking about how you can make different forms, make different public spaces. And so the space is not relying on a street wall and retail because it's a residential street. It can have retail if it develops. A place like Dufferin could do that fairly easily. These are blow-ups of that area as well. And the key thing is, at the same time you're developing the street, buildings on either side, you're also looking at the street itself. So you have that opportunity to, pr to provide a protected bike lane, better crossing areas, uh, better transit. All of those things can be taken into account when you're, when you're uh, redoing an, an avenue. And that's a detail shot again. Uh, this, is a, this is some of the work uh, from one of our students, Paulina Aviles, who looked at uh, Dufferin Street. Her section of Dufferin Street was actually from Bloor Street down to College. And you can see the Dufferin Mall is part of that. And uh, you can see, I mean, just to show you an example, some of the work, but really the kind of numbers that you're looking at in terms of intensification, if you have a normal block of it, let's just say 80 by 80, you're going to get about, I figure about maybe 100 people living in those houses. I did some rough numbers. We haven't done all, we haven't gotten into this level of research, but you can really increase the number of, of housing units times five, between times four and times five by doing this kind of work. And you can see this, you know, this has been explored in terms of the open spaces that are created, the built forms, the housing types, uh, looks like the, at the existing types, and some views of, of what you could get out of that. Well, this is a midterm presentation. We were having trouble trying to tell her what to do next because she was kind of finished two weeks ago. But we're having our final reviews on Tuesday, and we have a class of about eight people, four people working on Greenwood, and four people working in Dufferin. And the work's been really, really fascinating. And part of that, again, is looking at the street. This is from Paulina Avila's uh, uh, work again. But you can see that Dufferin Street, in this case, we're talking about you could have a dedicated transit line, an LRT line. You can have a protected bike lane, sidewalks, triple lines of trees, so you can actually have a linear park going up and down the sidewalk. So the whole quality of these on avenues, it is character that's not, not yet defined. 
It is actually an area that could be beautiful boulevards going north and south, connecting the north part of the city down to the waterfront. And they make good neighbors. In this case, um, which has been in the paper a lot lately, so I couldn't resist kind of putting it in. But you see how the kind of the main street kind of evolution of this type, which has become so dense, is not really a good neighbor, even when it saves the, uh, you know, this, this is a King and Dufferin, so this is not built yet, of course, but that, you know, beautiful little gem of a building is preserved, but because there's no open space associated with these types, it's crowded, it's cramped, and, uh, and it's like a big giant football player beside it. This is an earlier proposal we did years ago for uh, Liberty Village before it got built up. And it was how would you, you know, respond to this kind of little, little kind of two or three story kind of manufacturing building. And, and to provide, again, employment, pop, uh, employment land type spaces for artists and for people who are actually wanting to work in Liberty Village and who would be displaced. These kind of building types, while they're not quaint little cottages and studio and warehouses anymore, no one can afford to be in those. You have to find a building type that will allow people to stay in them. And if they're higher, they can still stay in them because they're cheaper. And we've had students who were suggesting, well, I just want little two-story places for my artists. Well, it'll cost them $3 million. You know, so it's not gonna work. So the idea of that building types gives you space around the existing building, because you can put a courtyard around it, which can also connect to other courtyards. And then the multiplication of this, this is a, another application for this building type uh, further on, actually, along Danforth. But what it shows you is that the connection of these courtyards can make, the, we're not talking about wholesale uh, substitution of small, cute little houses with big high rises. We're talking about creating new open spaces that connect to the street, that connect to each other, so that when you live in one of these places, you have a space, you have a courtyard, you have a connection to the street and you have a kind of relationship of, of air around you in space. So I think that's my last slide. But I just wanted to say, in closing, that I think uh, it's really important to talk about creating new models. Um, there's a Buckminster Fuller quote that I don't normally quote, but I thought it was kind of good. It says, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So this is what we'd like to suggest as relief for Main Street. Leave the Main Streets alone, build on avenues. Thank you.